Yeah, so I wanted to show you uh, this program that we were discussing uh, uh, and I want to show that I'm actually able to run this uh, and I'm using here C um, notice that the, the ANSI standard for C does not allow nested functions uh, I'm here uh, using code blocks and code blocks uses the GCC compiler and the, the GCC compiler has an extension to the ANSI C standard which indeed allows nested functions so for example inside the function test here I'm able to declare or define another function f uh, and the function g as well so and if you actually try this in in C++ the compiler will would not accept it so this is only a, an extension in C but this is the program that we were looking at earlier uh, on the slides that uh, we have uh, so in my case main doesn't do anything except calling test and test has its local variable x is equal to 1 uh, and then it uh, defines the two functions and the really the main code the body of the code in test is uh, here so it has its local variable x equal to 4 and then it calls the function g with f as a function parameter so notice that I'm able to uh, send a function as a parameter to c and that's also true for c++ the only difference between the two languages here is that I cannot have nested or the, GC, the g++ compiler which is the c++ compiler of, G, of gcc um, it does not allow uh, nested functions so what happens well we know that C is a statically scoped language and we said earlier that uh, languages that use static scope they also use deep binding so the environment to use for this function f here is um, uh, associated at compile time so and it's uh, uh, done by using deep binding meaning that when we call G with the function F it is at that point that the environment is uh, uh, found out it's not when the function call is happens inside G so when we call G with a function F the Binding policy says that uh, the non-local environment for F must be the one that is in the outer block. So the X inside F here is the one in the outer block. It's this one here. So we should get the value, what was it? 6, wasn't it? So let's see. G calls, we call G with a function F. We apply f of 3, which is uh, gives us 1 plus 3, which is 4. So h of 3 returns 4, and then we add 2 to it, and we get 6. So if I run this, I get the value 6. So, uh, how is this then implemented? Uh, well, and let's just consider the static scope and deep binding, like the one that I showed uh, in the C example here. Uh, so we're saying that the uh, the information about the static chain pointer must be determined at the moment the association between the formal and the actual parameter is created. So we are saying that we need the information about the static chain pointer for f because once f will be executed f needs to have this correct static chain pointer in order to find the 
memory location for this non-local variable x. And this static chain pointer will be found, will be set at the moment we link uh, this formal parameter h to the actual parameter f. Uh, so the formal h must not only be associated with the code for f, but also the non-local environment. So notice that when we call uh, f here, this formal, must be associated with the machine code for f, because we have to be, when we do h or 3, we have to jump to the code to, for f. And so it's not only the code itself, but it also the static chain pointer. So within the block in which the call g of f occurs, we can statically associate it with the parameter f, this, the information about the nesting level of the definition of f. What, what, what does this mean? Uh, inside this block here, when we call g, we can statically find out what should be the uh, static chain pointer for f. We can do that by applying the same methods that we have discussed earlier by calculating the differences between the nesting levels. This block is at nesting level uh, 2. Um, assuming that uh, the block up here is at nesting level 1. So, uh, and this uh, block here is also at uh, nesting level 2. So, the correct static chain pointer for this f is the same static chain pointer as for this block here, which means it's uh, the static chain pointer should point to the outer block here for test. So, and this is something that we had discussed earlier that it, we are able to, by using these nesting levels, we are able to find out at uh, compile time uh, what the static chain pointer should point to. So, we're really saying that a formal function parameter is associated with a pair. It has a pointer to a code, which is the machine uh, code for the function itself, and it's also a pointer to an activation record. And this is called a closure. And the first component then is used to transfer control to the code, and the second is assigned to the static chain pointer uh, of the activation record for the new invocation. So when we when at, at runtime f is executed, it has to have the correct static chain pointer for it, for, for it, for it has to be able to find the memory location for x. And uh, the memory location for x is then inside the activation record for this block test or this function test. So f here has a static chain pointer that points to the activation record for the outermost block. If we go back, the outermost block, oops, the outermost block has uh, x here declared and the static chain pointer for f points to that, the static chain pointer for g points to the outermost block as well. So both f and g point to the outermost block and then when uh, g is called with f as a function parameter then h is the formal parameter which really stands for f. h has associated with it um, a closure where the first component of the closure is, is a pointer to the code for f, and the second component is a static chain pointer, which points to the uh, 
block where it points to the enclosing block for f, which is the outermost block. So uh, let's then finally talk about functions as results. We had talked, we have, have been talking about functions as parameters. So uh, if we are able to generate functions uh, as the result of other functions, then we can do this. We can really dynamically create functions at the runtime. If a function can return another function, then at the runtime we can dynamically create new functions. Uh, functions that are returned as result, they have to be represented uh, also by code and the environment in which the function will be evaluated. So that's very similar to what we talked about earlier about functions as parameters. So at execution time, a function that is returned as a result has to be um, uh, represented with a closure. Remember, the closure is the pointer to the code for the function and a pointer to the activation record uh, that holds information about the non-local environment. Uh, so for a function whose value is obtained dynamically, the static chain pointer of its activation record is determined using this closure. Just as we saw earlier, this closure here. The closure is appointed to code and also the second pair is appointed to an activation record. So let's look at an example here. Uh, and here we have a, a, a special syntax. We have uh, we start a block here, which has a local declaration x equal to 1. This outermost block ends at the, at the bottom of the page here. Then inside the outermost block, we have a declaration of a function, f. And what is the type of the function? The type of the function is uh, void to int. So it, the function f uh, returns a function that takes void as a parameter, meaning nothing, and returns an integer. Okay, we see that in a minute. Um, so inside f, we have a definition of a function g, which returns an integer. And that function g doesn't take anything uh, as a parameter. It returns x plus 1. Uh, once again, x is a non-local reference, so it must be the one in the enclosing block. It's up here. Uh, now, what does the function f do? It just returns the function g. f returns another function. So f returns g. Um, and what is the type of g? Well, we can see it here in the header of g that it doesn't take anything as input. So that's why we have a void here. But it returns uh, an integer. That's what it stated here. So the function f then returns a function that takes a void as input and returns an integer. Now in the main uh, program, we declare a variable gg here that is of the type void to int. And we initialize gg with the result of the function called to f. So we call f and what do we get back? We get back a function. We call it gg, and that function doesn't take anything as input, but returns an integer. And finally, we call the function g, gg, and we get back an integer because the function gg doesn't take anything as input, but returns an integer. So we don't supply anything to gg because it's just void as a parameter and uh, uh, returns an integer. So this is, a, in our pseudo language, this would be the, the syntax of uh, declaring a function that returns another function. And uh, notice that I would not be able to implement this program in C or C++ because uh, uh, in C or C++ I cannot return functions. Uh, C, C++ is not a functional 
program language. Now, when looking at this here, example, there is not, there's no problem associated with this because when the function uh, g x is executed down here, the reference to the non-local variable x is the one in the outermost block. And the outermost block is alive. Because when we call gg, our outermost block is alive, which means that the x that is declared in the outermost block is alive. But the problem is, in general, that it is possible to return a function from inside of a nested block, which refers to a name that according to a stack discipline is going to be destroyed. What do we mean by this? Well, let's look at the next example here, which is very similar to the first example, um, except that x is now inside the function f. See the difference here. x is outside the function f in the former example, whereas x is inside the function f in the latter example. And why does this make any difference? Well, the thing is now that when we call f, uh, or f to f has executed, the activation record for f is destroyed. What does that mean? Well, it, does, it means that this x here, inside the function f, is not alive anymore x has a place in the activation record for f, but once f has executed, the activation record for f is popped off the stack, so x is not, um, uh, cannot be referenced anymore. But what did f do? f returned the function g uh, that executes the code return x plus 1, and that x here, when we finally execute g, uh, will try to reference a variable x that is not alive anymore. It's not accessible anymore. So this is an example of uh, returning a function which refers to a variable that would be destroyed using these, the, the, the stack discipline. So what can we do? Well, the only thing that really can be done in this case is to abandon the stack discipline for activation records. And uh, so in languages with these characteristics, where we can return functions as a result of other functions, uh, the, the local environments really have unlimited lifetime. Uh, so in functional languages, and remember those are the languages that can return functions from other functions, activation records are not allocated on the stack, but they are allocated on the heap. Because if they're allocated on the stack, if we're using stack discipline, then uh, activation records are popped off the stack and we get into problems like that, that we just discussed. But if they are allocated on the heap, they are not destroyed until the garbage collector uh, decides to do so. And the garbage collector has functionality so that it will only deallocate memory of the heap if it finds that uh, no object is referring to the space that has been allocated. So that the, the important point here is that if we have a language, like a functional programming language, that uh, allows uh, one to return functions uh, as the result of other functions, then the activation records are not stored on the stack, but on the heap.